So one time I saw this guy on a bridge, and he was about to jump. And I looked at him, and I yelled out, don't do it! And he, he looked back at me in the corner of his eyes and said, nobody loves me. As he peered down, and I said, no, that's not true. God loves you. Do you believe in God? He said, yeah, I do. He said, well, are you a Christian or are you Jewish? He said, I'm a Christian. And I said, me too. Are you a Protestant or Catholic? He said, I'm a, I'm a Protestant. I said, me too. Are you, uh, what denomination are you from? He said, well, I'm a Baptist. I said, me too. Are you a Northern Baptist or a Southern Baptist? And he said, I'm a Northern Baptist. I said, me too. Are you a Northern Conservative Baptist or a Northern Liberal Baptist? He said, I'm a Northern Conservative Baptist. I said, me too. Are you a Northern Conservative Baptist Santa Barbara region or Northern Conservative Baptist Goleta region? He said, I'm a Northern Conservative Baptist Santa Barbara region. I said, me too. Are you a Northern Conservative Santa Barbara Region Council of 1879 or a Northern Conservative Baptist Santa Barbara Region Council of 1912? He said, I'm a Northern Conservative Baptist Santa Barbara Region Council of 1912. I said, die, heretic, and I pushed him off the bridge. <laughs> Obviously, I'm kidding. That's a joke. Don't go to the news press with that. Uh, that's a rather famous joke from a comedian by the name of uh, Emo T uh, Towns, I believe. The reason I like it and hate it is because, as one comedian uh, put it, every joke, every act of comedy is, is truth and pain. There's something true about the joke, and there's also something painful about the human experience. Here's what's true. And why we laugh is that we, we recognize that in the human personality, our tendency to make a big deal about small things, right? You're from the Council of 1912. How dare you push you over the bridge? There's truth in that, that we tend to make a big deal out of small things. But the pain in this joke is that we don't just make a big deal out of small things. We hurt people over small things. We reject them. We push them over bridges because of slight differences in our makeup. And while we might not, although this has been true historically, that people have killed other people, as is the, the pain in this joke, over small differences. We might not kill people, literally, but we will metaphorically in our minds, in our thoughts, with our judgment, with our condemnation. And for things that sometimes don't even matter, that's the, that's the, the main part of this joke, is that what, these, what this, these guys should be unifying around is what they have in common, that they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and maybe even be thrilled that they're a part of a small network of churches in Santa Barbara or whatever. But what, what the first guy, what the first person finds enough to divide over is a small, insignificant, tiny detail. This is what's happening in the text before us in Luke chapter 9. John answered and said, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. Casting out demons in your name. Not speaking in your name. Not offering a cracker in your name. Casting out demonic oppression in your name. Amazing. But we tried to stop him because he wasn't with us. But Jesus said to him, don't, don't stop him. Uh, what we see in this text is the truth and the pain in that same joke that I opened up with. We see this condemning of people's actions, even if they're good actions, simply because they're not a part of our tribe. Now, tribes are, are not bad per se. You're a part of some, probably, and I am too. Tribes are a helpful way of finding social identity. They're a way of helping to create even healthy categories by which to view the world and ourselves. They can give us a sense of healthy pride. Tribes are not necessarily bad. I'm not talking about tribes per se, but when it devolves into what I'd like to call tribalism. Tribalism is when our social group pride becomes dangerous. 
It's when we developed dangerous and destructive, unhealthy patterns of behavior and attitudes that stem from our strong loyalty to our own tribe or to our own social group. It's no longer, I, I feel proud because I, I'm a part of this group, but everybody else that's not in my group is bad, even if they're doing good. Tribalism, condemning people's actions simply because they're not a part of your tribe. In this instance, it happens because of a person casting out demons. 2,000 years later, in our day, I'd say it takes at least three different contemporary faces. Want to hear them? Rhetorical question. <laughs> Just kidding. One, we could call sectarianism, okay? Uh, believing that your church or your denomination is superior to all the others. My spiritual community is better than all the others. Now, I'm not talking about a sense of healthy pride. Like, I love going to reality. It's the best. I don't mean that. I'm talking about the destructive way in which we view and condemn others because they don't do things the way that we do them. Sectarianism. Uh, another one, which we've spoken about, I think about a year, a year or two ago, is nationalism. That's believing that your nation, geographic nation, is superior to others. I think that one can be broken down even further in what we could call partisanship, partisan ideology. Believing that your political ideology or party is God's party. And this is where people's Christian faith gets co-opted by political ideology so deeply that they can't even see where one begins and the other ends. Your ideology has become your Christian faith. Now, again, I want to preface this and continue to caveat this with that it's okay to have an ideology. It's okay even to have a party. If, that's what, if that helps you by providing categories by which to process the world and your beliefs, that's fine. What's destructive is when our allegiance begins to focus on the ideologies of the world instead of the way of Jesus and the kingdom of God. I've often been told, you know, we're a week away from Thanksgiving, I've often been told you're not supposed to mix politics, religion, and meals, and I'm doing that right now. <laughs> Second year in a row. Um, but it gets, it, it gets worse in the text, a little more intense. What, what we just covered right there is condemning people's actions because they aren't part of your tribe. We're going to see something a little more sinister in the next verse. It says, when the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive Jesus because his face was set towards Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, uh, they had a nickname in the New Testament in another gospel, they're called the Sons of Thunder, and here's perhaps why. Lord, you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? You know what they're asking? Can we kill them? Can we, can we kill them all? Where we were just talking about condemning people's actions because of, they aren't part of your tribe, this is now a little more sinister. Condemning people themselves because they aren't a part of your tribe. What's this look like today? I think we would have to say racism. Now, I think I've brought up racism at least three or four times in my tenure here as a pastor at Reality Santa Barbara. And each time I've noticed that it, it almost feels like in the room that there's almost an automatic switch that goes off, that lets us off. I've noticed this in conversations. And it goes like this, oh, racism, that's a strong word, and I'm not one. So let's move on to the next point. It's this idea that racism is not my problem, because I'm not racist. And I think that the confusion in this issue has to do with terms that we're confused by, perhaps. And that's the difference between prejudice, which is in my experience, what most people think of when they're talking about this and racism. Here's the difference. 
Prejudice ha- is usually what a lot of people, as I speak with them, are talking about when they're talking about racial issues. Prejudice. That is the personal feeling of bias against another person because of the color of their skin. And if I were to ask everyone in this room, are you racial, uh, excuse me, racist? Uh, I think probably a lot of us would say no. Of course not. Here's my rhetorical question for you. What, are, what would be the evidences that you could offer the Son of God to say and to show, I do not struggle in any way with racial barriers or obstacles of any kind? Well, you might say, you might bring up personal reasons. I don't feel animosity towards people of color. Uh, I have nothing against people of color. You might even bring up this one. I hear this one a lot. I, I, have a, I have a Latino friend, or I have a black friend, right? And because of that, I, have, I can show that there's no racism in my heart whatsoever. What we're describing there is our personal feeling of prejudice towards other people. I do not have an explicit hostility or animosity towards others. Now, that's not including implicit prejudice, which I'll save for another sermon. Simply talking about personal feelings, and that might be true of you, but that's not racism. Here's the difference between prejudice and racism. According to some of the sociologists of our day, prejudice has to do with your feelings towards another person based on the color of their skin. Racism has very little to do with your personal feelings, and it has more to do with systems of advantage based on people's color of skin, okay? That means you could be totally chill with people of color and still be operating, still be silent before systems of advantage, racist systems of advantage, still be complicit in those very systems, even benefit from those same systems and still have an African-American or a Latino or an an Asian-American friend. The reason I'm bringing this up is because I think this pops up in the text in front of us. Let me show you. When we see the interaction between the Samaritans and uh, these Jewish Christian disciples, we are seeing racial prejudice, feelings, uh, we see it in the Samaritans, right? I'll give you a little background, a little uh, context. Samaria was a town situated between Galilee in the south and Jerusalem in the north. In order for you to get from one city, Galilee, to Jerusalem, which was a very common trek, you had to go through the city of Samaria. But Jewish people never went through the city of Samaria, even though it was the closest route. They always went around the city of Samaria, even though it put some time on their commute. Why did they do it? They could not stand the Samaritans and vice versa. That's why it was so shocking in John chapter 4 when Jesus said on his way from Galilee to Jerusalem, I must needs, I love how the King James puts this, I must needs go through Samaria. Well, no, he didn't, have, he didn't must needs go through Samaria. The social and cultural norm of that day was to go around Samaria. That would have been highly expected. Why did he must needs go through Samaria? Because he had an appointment with a woman at the well who was Samaritan. That's why his disciples were shocked throughout the entire outcome. And so we see that racial prejudice here in this text the, from the Samaritans. Because Jesus' face was set towards Jerusalem, they wanted nothing to do with him. But we see something a little more sinister in the response of the disciples, don't we? We see a sense of vindictiveness. I'm going to push you off the bridge then. They're literally requesting to kill the Samaritans. But here's what I want you to focus your attention on. They are asking Jesus to do it. These disciples have seen Jesus' incredible displays of power, miraculous power, supernatural power, healing power, the opening up of of blind eyes and deaf ears, the raising of the dead, the healing and the feeding of the 5,000. 
They are now asking. They're not the ones to do it. They are now asking to use his power, his privilege, and his influence and resources in order to control this people group. Now we've moved from personal prejudice to racism. And Jesus is quick to shut that down, as we should be. These are, I believe, some of the biggest obstacles to the evangelical church in America. Now, I try really hard not to be sensational when I'm preaching, so that you'll believe me. I try really hard not to use superlatives, like this is the best thing or this is the worst thing, because truly speaking, most things are not the best thing or the worst. They're just ordinary. I also do that because in the event that I need to speak to something deeply important, your ears will not be callous to what I'm saying, and so I'm saying it now. These vignettes of tribalism that I just brought up in our day are some of the biggest obstacles to the power and potency of the evangelical church in America today. Not the church universal. The global church is exploding in unprecedented revival across the world. Revivals in Africa and Latin America and Asia that the world has never seen before. The spirit of the living God is being poured out abroad on this globe in ways that history has never been witnessed to before. The only place where it has seemed to die down to a trickle is in the West, in Europe and in America. In my studies which have been years in the making of Jesus, the way of Jesus, the kingdom of God, the scriptures, but also with an ear to the ground. I have become convinced that these are some of the biggest obstacles to the power and potency of Christ's church where we are today. Here's why. Let's talk about each of these briefly. Sectarianism where we believe that our church or our spiritual group is the one chosen by God and everybody else is wrong. Why would that, why would that deter the effectiveness of God's church uh, in our world or in our, in our sphere? I want to draw your attention to John chapter 17, where Jesus prayed to the Father this prayer about you and me. Father, make them one even as you and I are one, that the world may see them and believe that you sent me. You hear what Jesus is saying in his high priestly prayer? He's connecting the effectiveness and mission of his kingdom to our ability to be unified together. He would describe disciples in this way. You will know that they are my disciples because of their love for one another. Again, God's kingdom and his work is expanding in ways that would blow our minds out of our mind hole. (laughs) But it's a trickle in America. Why? Perhaps uh, Perhaps Jesus' high priestly prayer can give us a glimpse of that. Nationalism. Why would that be a problem? The sense that our group, our country is the only good one, the one chosen by God. Well, it's because when we search the Scriptures, we see that God is a God of all nations. And yes, He loves ours, just like He loves Czechoslovakia and Afghanistan and Iran and Russia and the Antarctica and so on and so forth, uh, so on and so forth. We have a God of the nations, and His nation is not comprised of geographical limits. It's made up of people. In 1 Peter chapter 2, he calls the body of Christ his chosen people, his holy nation, a people after his own possession. People who are not a people before, but have been made a people because of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. <clears throat> Partisanship. Why would that be a problem? Again, just to clarify my terms, When our ideology or our party, we believe, is the one chosen by God, the only one that he's blessed. Here's why that's a problem. Jesus said in John chapter 18, verse 36, that my kingdom is not of this world. 
If it were, I would send people into battle to fight, but my kingdom is not of this world. His kingdom transcends the kingdoms of this world. That means if you are unable to criticize your human systems through the lens of the kingdom of God, you might have become in danger of co-opting your faith with a political system. If you cannot set it up against the kingdom of God and point out problems, and this should happen on both sides, if you cannot do that, you might have been co-opted by a human system. I heard one pastor put it this way. He said, the reason, speaking of uh, the mascots here, the reason that we are so divided over the elephant and the donkey is because the people in our churches have not been taught enough about the lamb and his kingdom. I want you to be clear today on what to expect if you come to this church. I'm going to teach about the kingdom of Jesus Christ until you're blue in the face. Or red in the face. (laughs) Whatever. Racism. Whenever I bring this up, I'm often shot down. Or I'm sometimes shot down, I should say. Uh, usually with lines like this. Can't you just preach the Bible? Can't you just stick to the gospel? Why are you getting political? I've uh, tried to answer some of those objections and concerns in past uh, sermons, so suffice it to say that this is the gospel. The gospel is the good news that God left his world, brought a piece of his world to bear on our world. Through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, He has made a way open for us to be reconciled to God and to be reconciled to one another. When we look at the end game in Revelation chapter 4, we see a picture of what the kingdom is supposed to look like, a taste perhaps of what it might look like now. That is people and tribes and nations and tongues gathered around the person of Jesus Christ in equality, equally raising up their voices in unison to the God of their salvation. The truth is, Jesus came preaching, not just forgiveness of sins. He came preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. And these four obstacles are antithetical to the kingdom of God because in some way or another, they established their own individualistic kingdom, a kingdom raised up against God's kingdom. And Jesus rebukes those things. He rebukes tribalism, and we should listen to the same rebuke. And he redirects tribalism. We should surrender to that redirection. And for us, I think it would start by going to the basics of the gospel, going back to the kingdom of God. The kingdom changes everything. If our worship and if our view is not of uh, little systems and little kingdoms that we have set up for ourselves, but a high view of heaven and a high view of God and a high view of Christ's kingdom, it will change certain things about how we interact with other people. Here's three things that we should see if the kingdom of God starts permeating our church. I'm not even talking about other churches. I'm talking about reality Santa Barbara. Here's what we should expect. Here's what we should hope for. Here's what we should dream about. Instead of sectarianism, we should see a more ecumenical spirit. We'll still be reality Santa Barbara. We'll still have a denomination, a tribe, a family. That's great. But we'll also see other families. And we'll begin to celebrate the differences in those families. The kingdom of God should cause you to look out at Reformed churches, Charismatic churches, Pentecostal churches, Anglican churches, black gospel churches, everything in between, and see the image of God being expressed in them, some element of the kingdom alive and well in them. Yes, there's differences. Yes, we're all doing something wrong. Forget about that stuff. Notice I'm not talking about world religions here. I'm just talking about the church. It is true that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and there's no other way to the Father except through him. I'm not talking about other world religions or cults. I'm talking about the church of Jesus Christ expressed in a variety of ways that is beautiful 
but that requires humility. It requires, for some of us who come from traditions and church backgrounds that say our way or the highway, it's going to require that we drop that in place of humility. Here's something else we should see and long for and pray for and hope for and dream about, is instead of a deep allegiance to ideologies, we should see a sense of being set apart by God, an otherworldliness, if I can put it that way. That we would believe Paul when he says that our citizenship is in heaven and that our kingdom is not of this world. And so why are we here? We're here to spread a kingdom. Make no mistake about the kingdom that you're here to spread. The third thing that we should see, hope for, pray for, desire, and dream about is a multicultural church. Notice that I didn't just say multi-ethnic. A multi-ethnic would be a church that has people of different ethnicities in the building. A multicultural church is different. A multicultural church is where every single tribe, to use that biblical language, every people group, is dignified in their voice, in their leadership, in their giftings. They all have a seat at the table. It's not just one group controlling all the others. And that's hard. I think, uh, statistically speaking, uh, a little over 3% of all the Christian churches in America are actually multicultural. Very rare, because it's very hard. Because we don't want to be in a room with people that aren't like us, giving them power, giving them our privilege, and giving them our voice. We want homogenous churches. I'm not speaking about you directly, I'm just, you know, about the world. <laughs> Why do we want homogeny? Because it's safe. It's comfortable, and it allows us some semblance of control. But that is not the kingdom of God. I know these three things are incredibly large, huge. Maybe you're tripping on them. Maybe you don't even know what to do because they're so big. It just one of those things is huge. But all three... Maybe you're overwhelmed by that. Maybe you don't even know where to start. Maybe you're struggling with what I'm saying. You don't, you're not even sure if you, you can believe me yet. That's okay. Practicing an ecumenical spirit. And there's room for doubts. I hope you feel that way at this church. There's room for asking questions. What I want to do, uh, one of my favorite things to do with people is to take huge, monstrous, impossible goals and to boil them down into bite-sized, small next steps. I love doing that. I love doing that with myself. I love doing that with other people. And I want to do that with you right now because these are huge. How can we be more like the kingdom of Jesus as expressed in an ecumenical spirit, a sense of being set apart from this world, but also a multicultural gathering unified around the gospel of God's kingdom? Huge. Huge. I want to give you one next step that I hope people who call this their church will grab onto and practice for the rest of their lives starting tomorrow. This isn't the only thing, but this is a definite thing, and it's certainly a beginning thing. One word. Listen. For those of you that feel overwhelmed by everything that I'm saying, maybe even discouraged, one tiny next step in the direction of God's kingdom. Listen better. Practice listening. You know what all of those four obstacles have in common? A refusal to listen. A refusal to listen. A refusal to listen to people who have a different belief than you a refusal to listen to people who have different life experiences and pain that you maybe don't even understand, a refusal to listen to people who do certain things, spiritually speaking maybe, in a, a different way than you do, to where you get into a conversation and you have immediately shut off any type of avenue for communication because you already believe that your way is the right way. That is the power and sinister subtlety of tribalism. And that is what the kingdom of God dismantles brick by brick. You want to start dismantling it today? 
practice listening. Not to people just like you, to people unlike you. For some of you, maybe it's a church thing. Maybe you grew up in a church that just felt like you guys were the only good church in the world and everybody else were heretics. And your whole life has been spent pushing people off bridges. You know what a great practice for you would be? Go visit a different church. Like next week. I wouldn't mind if next Sunday this whole building was empty. If that's what we need to do, go visit a different church. Don't visit a church just like yours. Visit one that you think you disagree with. But don't go there to scrutinize that that place of worship. Go there to celebrate. Go there with eyes open and ears open saying, God, show me your beauty and your kingdom in this group of people so that I can be stretched and conformed into your beautiful image. Go to a different church next week. Uh, If your thing is like politics and you're a Democrat, maybe uh, take a Republican out to lunch. Or if you're a Republican and you hate Democrats, then take a Democrat out to, to tea. Tea, I don't know. I just came back from <laughs> London. Weird. Coffee. <laughs> Coffee. But listen, this is very important. There's an art to listening. Don't go to argue your point. Everybody knows you have one. We don't need to know your point. Go to understand them. Every person you will ever meet in this life has a world of experiences and pain, childhood, upbringing, things that have shaped them drastically into the person that they are. It doesn't mean everything that we believe is right or good. It just means that it's true. And if you want to be more like Jesus in this life, practice listening to where other people are coming from. Practice listening with empathy. Don't go in there saying, I'm, I'm listening. I'm listening, but I'm listening in order to formulate just the most airtight response that will decimate your argument. Yeah. Anybody ever do that, like, with your spouse? You're kind of listening, but you're just just building up steam to, like, just tear apart their argument. No? Yeah, me neither. (laughs) Don't do that. Go in there. This will change the way you listen. Go Go into that meeting or that coffee date or that lunch or that sit down in the park, whatever it is, or the living room, just to know them a little bit more than you did. You'd be surprised at what that might do to your soul and to your relationships. Again, we're not trying to change each other's mind. You might leave that lunch not believing anything differently. That's not the point. The point is love. And a facet and a vignette of love is empathy. Uh, Maybe it's race. Maybe you just don't understand any of this stuff. Maybe it doesn't affect you. Maybe you've gone through your entire life and racism has not affected you. You're like, what's the big deal? Are we even really in a, like, is racism even really a thing? I think that you should have friends that don't look like you. Because that's the kingdom. You should have friends who don't look like you. That would be a great start for us as a church, is to hang out, at least occasionally, with people who aren't like us and don't look like us. If that's difficult, start reading books. But don't read the books that you've been reading. Don't listen to the news pundits that you've been listening to. Don't listen to the, the, only your friends that look just like you and believe the same things that you do. Listen to people of color. Read their books. If you don't know where to start and you're wondering, like, is is race like a thing? I recommend a a book called The Myth of Equality by a pastor in Oregon by the name of Ken. Good old Ken. You can start right there. It's winsome. It's generous. It's kind. It's prophetic. Uh... If you're saying, well, maybe it is a problem, but I think the evangelical church is doing just fine. Let's just continue in the status quo, and things will get better. I want to recommend to you this book, Divided by Faith, by a couple Christian sociologists, highlighting how actually the evangelical church itself is full of systems that are perpetuating racism. 
If you guys don't like academic stuff or uh, pros in that regard, you just want to hear a story and you're feeling particularly bold, I recommend Between the World and Me uh, by Ta-Nehisi Coates. Uh, it's, a, it's a series of letters between an African-American dad and his son. Um, do stuff like that. Let's get out of our bubble and start learning, start empathizing, start listening. For some of you, it might be books. For some of you, it might be conversations. For some of you, it might be an honest prayer with your Bibles open, asking God, hey, help me. Help me to listen and understand. Help me to rid myself of the obstacles that I see you highlighting. A good lit uh, litmus test for us today is, can you listen with empathy to believers on the other side? Notice that in this first paragraph, John and the other disciples are talking about somebody who's actually on their side, casting out demons in the name of Jesus Christ. But they got their weapons on each other in the trenches. It's time for us to stop focusing on our brothers and sisters in the trenches with us under our true enemy, the devil, and to tap into the power of the kingdom of God. And a small way that you can do that is by listening. Now, I want you to start listening tomorrow, because today we listen to Jesus. I'm going to ask Robert and uh, the rest of the band to come up as we sing. As we endeavor next week to listen to people, let's start this day to listen to Jesus. If you're struggling with this, if this is hard, confusing, challenging, maybe you don't even agree with it, hey, no problem. Talk to Jesus today. Ask him to sort it out. My kids, when they want to get my attention, uh, they do this thing. They jump in my lap. And he's usually I'm reading a book or I'm reading, you know, or I'm doing something, and I might not, I'm a horrible multitasker, so all sorts of things can be happening around me. And my son, Jude, or my daughter, Abby, will jump right in my lap, and they, have, they do this thing where they grab me by my, my cheeks, and they pull my face up from the book I'm reading, and they're like, Dad, you know, Dad, look it! And then they'll show me whatever it is that they wanted me to see. Um, the beautiful thing about our Father in Heaven is that we do not need to capture His attention. His eyes are upon you. Um, but He still teaches us to do things like children, have you noticed, in the Bible? And the way that we're taught to grab Him by the cheeks is by opening up in prayer and listening to Him. Jesus taught us to do this in the best way by giving us the Lord's Prayer. And so what I want to do today as we transition into song, in this incredibly challenging subject, subjects, is to listen to Jesus, but to first do it in this posture where we just grab him by the cheeks in a few lines of prayer that Jesus himself taught us to pray. And then we spend the rest of this morning together listening and perhaps responding in song, in sacrament, in worship, in emotion as we cry out before God and lift our hands and fall on our faces, that healing, true healing would come. And so if you would, let's, in your seats where you are, let's pray this out loud the way that Jesus taught us to pray. I think it's uh, on the screen for you. Ready? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.